This lecture will cover the major topics regarding air pollution and how it affects human health and some of the ways that it, we pollute our air and also some of the solutions we have to clean up air. Our atmosphere and the air gets inside of our bodies through ways that are well known to you through our respiratory system. We breathe in the air, it goes through our mouth, our pharynx, trachea, into the bronchial tubes and into the lungs in which our bronchioles, the smaller uh, pipes that go into the very last portion of the lung, which are the alveoli. And those alveoli have high surface area per volume. There are lots of surface area, little kind of like pockets where now that atmospheric air can um, go right against the walls and of the membranes of the VLI and oxygen can diffuse in directly into our bloodstream. Unfortunately, other things can get into our bloodstream too through that same, um, that same pathway, and those are the air pollutants that we'll discuss. These air pollutants enter our body again through the lungs and can move directly into the bloodstream and from the bloodstream they get pumped to lots of parts of our bodies, all parts pretty much. And um, they can even get into the brain. Of course we have blood flow in the brain too and we need oxygen there. Some particles less than 10 micrometers in diameter can get deep into your lungs and some may even get into your bloodstream. So not all the particles that are considered air pollution get into your lungs, they might stop on the way, all those other places, your mouth, your, your nose, your pharynx, they may not get all the way into the lungs if they're too big, but some can, and that's not good in your lungs, they can cause damage there, but then when they get into your bloodstream, they have other uh, effects. The things that are, le the particles that are less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter um, or known as fine particles or particulate matter, um, those pose the greatest threat to health. Those are the ones that can get directly into our bloodstream and flow everywhere. There are two main types of air pollution, or we can categorize them into point sources. And those are kind of like what they sound. They come out of a particular point that's identifiable, exhaust pipe, a smokestack, somewhere um, that is a point. Um, and there's also non-point source emissions that those originate in diffuse locations. They can be coming from lots of different places, maybe say agriculture or mining, where it immediately gets into the atmosphere and then that pollution just goes everywhere. Also, uh, automobiles would be considered somewhat of a point source, but there's so many of them, we create smog and that becomes a non-point source. So it's just a way to differentiate between two different types of air pollution. The wind can have a big effect on spreading air pollutants on a large scale, as you can see in these satellite images showing you dust blowing off of mainland China, that upper left, um, over into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is from 2002. It, and then um, upper right, a dust storm in Beijing, China showing you a huge dust cloud that that is tons of particulate matter there and some of that would get into our lungs some of it might be pollutants that are teeny and get into our bloodstream but a lot of this is just big stuff that's going to damage our lungs directly um, there's also a dust cloud that was um, observed over the gobi desert in uh, april of 1998 you can see that uh, left middle little picture and how it moved across the Pacific Ocean and even affected um, North America, Western North America. Um, dust storm samples from Asia, just a close up of the dust, lots of little flaky particulates. And that last two pictures on the bottom left and right, major dust storm on the left and right bacteria that came out of a major dust storm in North America. So these these uh, non-point sources travel far when there's a lot of wind. And so the atmosphere, if it wasn't already clear to you, is definitely a commons. It means whatever we put into the atmosphere spreads all over the place and it's everyone's problem and everyone's responsibility. 
The Asian brown cloud is an atmospheric brown cloud, also known as an ABC, and they're made up of pollution from uh, black carbon, just soot, organic carbon, and dust, also sometimes sulfates, nitrates, ash. All of these are dark, dense clouds moved by wind that scatter and um, prevent solar radiation from coming in. But the actual makeup of them are, are what has um, toxic effects to living organisms. Here's an image of one of those, um, the Asian brown cloud or airborne brown cloud coming off of Asia there. You see the Korean peninsula and this dust that's going pretty far out into the ocean. Black carbon, which is part of the airborne brown cloud, um, it's po particulate matter that's uh, pollution traveling far from the sources and it lands on snow and ice and glaciers on the poles that darkens the surface of the poles um, in general or those patchy areas that it, it lands and decreases albedo, increases heat absorption, and causes more melting. Because of the 1963 Clean Air Act, the United States started taking a formal look at air pollution and how we needed to try to solve this problem. In seven years later, 1970, there were amendments made to the Clean Air Act, and there's been a number of revisions over time. And in 1970 in particular, these six air pollutants were found to be the top um, problem. And those were considered pollutants that we would now focus our efforts at cleaning these up and, and reducing the amount of these in the atmosphere. So we're looking at these as criteria for a good air quality or low air quality. They're known as the criteria pollutants. Sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, carbon monoxide, ozone, and the volatile organic compounds that are ozone's precursor, and particulate matter, and lead. A little graphic here showing you the primary pollutants that are uh, put into the atmosphere by humans and there's some of their sources. Um, not all of them are anthropogenic, but most of them are. And then what they can transform into these secondary pollutants um, also and a little bit of the text of what I was describing in the last slide about how these criteria pollutants came about. Some explanation on what a primary pollutant is and what a secondary pollutant is. Primary pollutants are the ones that pose threats to human health as soon as released. Um, five of the six criteria or uh, pollutants are primary pollutants besides lead, and they're harmful as soon as released. That's the basic definition. Secondary pollutants are chemicals that become harmful after reacting with other substances or gases in the air. So those tend to be threats to crops, materials, climate, visibility, and personal comfort. Sulfur dioxides are a criteria pollutant um, focused on in the Clean Air Act, and they're also a primary pollutant. They're among the most damaging of all air pollutants. Um, they're, when you look at coal, we burn coal to create electricity that um, in certain parts of the world, and there's big, big coal uh, deposits in certain parts of the United States seen in that lower right graph. When there are low sulfur-containing coal types deposits and there are high sulfur-containing coal deposits, when we burn the high sulfur-containing coal, it puts sulfur dioxides into the air, and thus it becomes a problem. Some more information about sulfur dioxides, mostly from combustion of fossil fuels, including coal. Also, you get some produced by volcanoes naturally, um, but it, ha it creates health problems, especially in your lungs, creates inflammation, especially when it's uh, chronically, ex humans are exposed to it, it cause a lot of problems. And it can cause acid rain too, acidifies the rain while it's in the atmosphere before it comes down and then causes problems to soil and infrastructure by acidifying. 
This slide is um, explaining how some of our primary pollutants like nitrous oxides and sulfur dioxide that have their own damaging effects can also be transformed into um, secondary pollutants, something new that is, is created, and those can have damaging effects too. For example, sulfur dioxides can be transformed into sulfuric acid, and um, that's part of what creates the acid rain that falls down, and it's not good for agriculture at all. Um, nitrous oxides can turn into nitrates, and that can be okay in some places because plants can actually uptake that, but it also could be bad if it into, goes into an aquatic system and can cause over-nutrification of those aquatic environments. And both sulfur dioxides and nitrous oxides, when they're transformed into their acidic forms as a secondary pollutant, can create acid rain, which is damaging to forests, crops, aquatic systems, and even statues and human-built um, buildings of stone that get worn away. These are two methods humans use to reduce the carbon monoxide and nitrous oxide emissions that comes out of our fossil fuel uh, driven cars and um, vehicles. The catalytic converter actually separates the nitrogen um, molecule or the nitrogen atom from the oxygens. So it comes out as N2 gas and oxygen. Most of it does. Um, it can also control carbon monoxide too. It's um, estimated that a catalytic converter can convert 90% of the carbon monoxide and nitrous oxides from the engine into the less harmful carbon dioxide and nitrogen and oxygen and water. Kind of a sidebar here, carbon monoxide, sometimes called the silent killer. So it's a byproduct of um, combustion of our it's an incomplete burning of the hydrocarbons that are used in some heaters and other types of industrial machines when they use gasoline, natural gas, oil, kerosene, propane, charcoal, or even wood, it produces carbon monoxide. The reason it's called a silent killer is you can't smell it and you can't see it. So it could be in your house or car and you wouldn't know it and it could suffocate you. There are some plants that can use carbon monoxide in addition to carbon dioxide, but those are very few, and humans definitely cannot uh, extract, our respiratory systems can't take the oxygen out of the carbon monoxide, so um, it will make us suffocate. Particulate pollution is anything that's suspended in the air and is harmful to life. Earlier we talked about it as something that is very tiny to so they can get into your bloodstream, but it has a variety of definitions, and here are some of the sources of particulate matter shown graphically for you there. Here's a bit of technology that can help reduce particulate matter in the atmosphere. This is called an electrostatic precipitator, and it can remove 99% of the unburned particulates in smoke from power plants. So these are a type of technology that's starting to be used well, it's been around for a while, but put on smokestacks and um, gaseous effluents from industrial companies that have smoke that coming out of them. It's like a otherwise known as a scrubber, so it can clean that air before it gets released. Here's a little review of ozone and its formation and function. In the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, is a layer of ozone molecules. Those are O3, three um, atoms of oxygen bonded together. In comparison, oxygen that we breathe is O2. The layer functions to protect the planet's surface and its organisms from receiving DNA damaging types of ultraviolet light. So there's a lot of different types of um, light that comes to Earth. Some of it is um, visible, some of it un invisible. UV light is ultraviolet. We don't see it, but it has an effect on us and our planet. And there are some of it, um, it's all 
pretty much damaging to human life, especially ultraviolet light in the UVB range. So, and the ozone layer prevents most of the UVB um, radiation and UVC, these are types of ultraviolet light, from getting through where it can come, when it does come through, it can directly damage the DNA and the cells of living things, and we don't want that. So we need the ozone layer. So we want a nice, healthy layer of ozone in the stratosphere. Um, as we talked about before, the Montreal Protocol addressed this. Ozone depleting chemicals like CFCs, HCFCs, halons, and methyl bromide are all things that humans create and have used and they're pollutants that can degrade the ozone layer and reduce the protection it has uh, towards living creatures and protecting the DNA in their cells from being damaged by that ultraviolet radiation. Also, ozone can form um, as a secondary pollutant from the incompletely burned hydrocarbons and other pollutants that humans produce. Those things can change into ozone, not in the stratosphere, but down near the earth where we breathe. And that is also a problem that can cause bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, irritation. So it's a pollutant at the lower elevation or altitude levels. And it's a good thing up in the stratosphere. This is a picture of the ozone hole that was discovered around 2015, 16. Um, showing you in two, uh, excuse me, in 1971, the green, greenish would be a thick, healthy ozone layer, and the blue would be no layer or much thinned. 2017, it was seen that we have a hole, and the Montreal Protocol has helped put us back in an upward climb, increasing that stratospheric ozone again and closing up that hole over time. This slide describes uh, VOCs, or volatile organic compounds, and they're emitted from certain solids and liquids, chemicals that humans use. There's a list there of paints, preservatives, aerosols, cleansers, perfumes, stored fuels, dry cleaned clothing, and pesticides. They create health effects uh, that are listed there. And there are also is a list here of ways to keep yourself safe that these are another problem. And they are um, considered a precursor to other primary criteria pollutants. Lead, another criteria pollutant, doesn't have a, a immediate negative effect on living things, but it does in the long run. Lead um, can get into the bloodstream um, and when it does, it's a heavy metal, it's a toxin to humans, but it can um, slow and prevent maturation of um, neural tissue or brain. So kids that are exposed to um, lead in the water or soil or in the air, like it does happen. One of the reservations I work on in Oklahoma has a huge lead mine from the 1970s. And there's a lot of um, tailings, all the ore that they dug up to get the lead is left on the surface in a big pile. And when winds come up, the, some of the dust from the, that ore um, is airborne and, and it's carrying lead into water and soil. Also, in this town in northeastern Oklahoma, it's called Miami, Oklahoma, um, there's a lot of lead contamination and they saw children's um, brain development and capacity by looking at IQ tests um, much lower in those couple of decades because it directly affects, it's like retardation of the brain development by exposure to lead. It's a big problem. And um, we used to have lead in our gasoline. We don't anymore. That's good, um, but it, it still is um, exists and persistent in aquatic and terrestrial environments. And the good news is that um, almost all countries now ban leaded gas. That's great. An actual successful collaborative effort there. Now let's talk about some other major airborne pollutants, not the six criteria ones, but additional ones. Yep, there's more. Heavy metals can be a toxin that humans put out into the environment. 
Although in some ways, and in some cases, heavy metals are required. We need a little bit of iron, for example, to live. It's a, pretty much the center um, atom of the molecule hemoglobin. So heavy metals are necessary in tiny amounts, some of them, but there are plenty that are not, and in large amounts, definitely not. Let's look at some of those. The heavy metals, mercury, lead, cadmium, and copper are chemicals that uh, are definitely not good for living creatures, and they are put into the environment by humans from various manufacturing, industrial processes. Uh, things like mercury, you're showing you here the mercury cycle of how it's put out into the atmosphere from the burning of coal, and then it gets into the ocean system and causes problems. It's a neurotoxin. It's really pretty nasty thing that we put out into the atmosphere by burning coal to make electricity. Um, and there's some mercury in coal. So that's one of the heavy metals that is a pollutant from human causes. It's not all doom and gloom. I'm trying to balance things, showing you a problem, but showing you that there are people like this organization working on solving some of these problems, like minimizing mercury pollution. Another um, class that's not a heavy metal, but switching to other types of pollutants are dioxins, and they are the byproduct of, of course, human industrial processes. Um, one of them was uh, a byproduct of making white paper, like bleaching the fibers that make paper to be white um, a dioxin was a byproduct and released by, by paper companies, paper um, mills and companies into the rivers that they were situated on. So that has caused a lot of problem. Also, they're produced um, by improper municipal waste uh, burning, burning of trash and releasing these into the atmosphere. There's also natural causes or excuse me, natural sources of dioxins too. Um, forest fires and volcanoes, but those are a minority of the releases and emissions of this into the into the ecosystems of the world. And let me introduce to you the name of this one process called the global distillation process. That's the geochemical process, how these chemicals move throughout the earth in a number of, by a number of um, forces. But the movement of certain chemicals, mostly those persistent organic pollutants, something like a PCB that can, um, persistent meaning it just stays around for a long, long time. It doesn't break down and get transformed. These can be transported all over the earth, no matter where they are produced, and they can be another major airborne pollutant. Another source of airborne pollutants are homes, um, different things, in a home, especially a new home, will have toxic chemicals that volatilize and become airborne. Um, smoke, people smoking or wood smoke, creates a couple of things we've already talked about. The ash, the soot, okay, the big particles that aren't good for you, but also um, it could be creating some sulfur dioxides and nitrous oxides. You have the volatile organic compounds from um, this is showing you a light bulb, but it also comes, those come out of lots of different um, materials that are used in making a new home. Um, toiletries also, mold, cleaners, detergents, electronics, and cooking are all things that pollute the air inside the home. And because it's inside, there's more of a problem because those things do not get diluted they stay more concentrated and can cause health problems more easily. The EPA is working hard and has been for a number of decades to clean up our air and create new regulations and policies to limit these pollutants. In 2007, carbon dioxide was officially designated an air pollutant. Obviously, we need it. Um, plants need it. It's not unnatural, but the, the levels that are in our atmosphere are um, causing problems, and that's why it's considered a pollutant now. Let's now talk about some of the laws and policies 
that govern air pollutants and clean air. Rachel Carson was an American marine biologist and writer who wrote the book Silent Spring. And that book talked about the negative effects of pesticides, crop pesticides, on lots of different organisms, including humans, but um, it got its name from its negative effect on birds of those pesticides, that those um, pesticides could kill birds, um, re low reproduction, and we might have a, a spring that doesn't have any songbirds in it. Um, she also paved the way for the development of the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act by just bringing uh, the beginning awareness of people that our, our methods of um, industrialization, our processes and agriculture are causing harm to the air, water, and soil. Chai Jing is a Chinese journalist, and because of her daughter had a tumor in, um, in utero, even before it was born, it started motivating her to do investigation into China's environmental problems. And she produced this documentary called Under the Dome, um, released in 2015, but it, it talked about um, all the different ways the pollution in China is affecting humans, including especially airborne pollution, which is very visible in large cities in China. So she brought a lot of awareness um, to current pollution problems, including airborne pollution. And it, that movie has been censored and not allowed to be seen um, in the last couple of years. The Clean Air Act according to this little poster here, has been protecting the air since 1970. Uh, it has in some ways, for sure. It's, it's a good piece of legislation. We've had a number of amendments to it. We're updating it. Um, I think we can assume we're behind the game on air quality. We're still trying to clean things up, but um, at least we have this, and you can read in those little boxes some of the benefits of the Clean Air Act has had Excuse my bad French, but this is the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, and it's showing you a comparison of the 1960s, 70s, before leaded gas was uh, outlawed, and on the right after that, probably the 1990s picture. Much clearer. It's true of the LA Basin, too. It was much more densely polluted, for visible pollutants were heavier and people that lived in LA couldn't see the mountains, the San Bernardino or the San Gabriel Mountains, and now they can. So now we should be focusing not on how it looks, but actually the quality of the air besides the visible particulates, because there's a lot of invisible uh, pollutants still. There is a system for reducing greenhouse gas pollution, and that is the cap and trade system. The cap sets a maximum limit on the amount of greenhouse gas pollution that an industry can produce. So any one particular company has a cap on how much they can emit of these different pollutants. And over time, that cap is lowered, which means less greenhouse gas pollution and improved air quality. But those companies, it's some of it's, you know, a lot of it's on the burden of them to come up with ways to reduce those emissions, technologies, changes in production cycles, etc. The old way of um, reducing pollution at the human breathing level was just to create a tall smokestack so all of the emissions were way up above where people would see and breathe, but that doesn't count anymore. Um, cap and trade rewards innovation. If a company doesn't um, emit as much as their cap, they're rewarded with a credit. And if a company emits too much, they need to invest in credits from other companies. They have to buy them so they can buy and sell them. It's a, it's a innovative system and it, it's definitely doing some good. You know, uh, kind of philosophically, it's a little bit interesting to say like, well, you can kind of buy your right to, to pollute. I'm not sure that's the right way to go, but um, it's a step. In case you're feeling overwhelmed with uh, 
all the bad news about the air pollution and um, how much further we have to go, just know you can do all these things here on this slide to do, do your part to help with lowering emissions of pollutants. There's lots of things that you can do and feel act like you're actively part of the solution. That's important to feel hopeful and um, like you're doing something good.